Hello and welcome to Account Instruction Help and How To. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about audit risk assessment. At the end of this lecture, we will be able to describe what audit risk is, list the components of audit risk, explain the audit risk assessment process, describe how to act on the results of the risk assessment, and then list and explain documentation related to the risk assessment. So first we need to define what audit risk is, and the audit risk is going to be the risk that there is a material misstatement on the financial statements that was not detected through the audit process, and therefore we give an unqualified or favorable opinion when, in fact, that would be an incorrect opinion because there was a material misstatement on the financial statements. So that's going to be the audit risk that we're going to want to avoid. We're going to try to lower the audit risk to the acceptable levels. Now, when we think about that, of course, we're never going to get complete assurance on the audit. We're never going to get the audit risk down to zero. We're going to look through a process so we can systematically think about how to reduce the audit risk down to reasonable levels. Remember that we are giving um, reasonable assurance on the financial statements, not a complete guarantee on it. Now, when we think about the audit risk, of course, we're going to be thinking about it ultimately at the financial statement level, at the accounts on the financial statement being recorded materially correctly. That's what we're thinking about in total. But in order to plan the audit, in order to think through the audit, we're going to have to think about audit risk as it is applied to particular accounts and particular transactions and particular assertions in terms of those transactions. So we need to get a systematic way of looking through these types of accounts and use that model in order to set up our scope in terms of how much work we're going to do. So remember, we can't do the work on everything. We can't drill down on every account and check every transaction, of course, that would be far too large. Therefore, we're going to use some models in order to help us decide how much testing we need to do, what's going to be the scope, where do we want to spend our time. Now, we're going to look at the audit risk model in terms of a mathematical equation, and we could put numbers into the mathematical equation, but realize that this is not going to encompass a mathematical equation. It's not going to encompass everything because these are going to be very broad terms. So we, we can't really just put in numbers that would apply directly, but the logic behind the mathematical equation can help us to think through the process and see how we want to set things up and where we want to spend our time. The equation will be audit risk is going to be equal to IOR or inherent risk times CR or control risk times DR or detection risk. So let me say that one more time. The overall audit risk is going to equal the inherent risk times the control risk times the, dete the detection risk. We're going to apply these to individual accounts and individual transactions and try to set this and use this type of equation. Let's break this down. Let's take a look at inherent risk. Inherent risk, what is inherent risk? If we're looking at an account or a transaction or an assertion, we're saying that the inherent risk is going to be the risk involved in it without taking into consideration anything else such as internal controls. So if we're thinking about cash, for example, and transactions related to cash, that would be more inherently risky. We would say the inherent risk is higher in that case. We could put a number to it, but we could also say basically, yeah, it's going to be higher for cash. Why? Because cash is a more liquid asset. There's more transactions related to cash. There's more desire for people to want cash because it is a liquid asset. And therefore, it's going to be more inherently risky, meaning the risk in, in it is inherent. It's just part of that thing. And um, if we think about something else like equipment, like a forklift, it's got less inherent risk. Why? Because it's less likely that we're just going to lose a forklift or someone's just going to drive the forklift off. Uh, that doesn't mean that there's no risk involved in it. That just means that it's not as inherently risky as cash. So that's going to be the inherent risk. Now, some businesses overall, of course, are just going to be more inherently risky. If we're talking about a business that sells diamonds or something like that versus a business that sells the forklifts, uh, the, the risk related to that inventory, the inventory of diamonds and the valuation of the diamonds, that's probably more inherently risky than uh, the, the company that sells forklift or, or bookkeeping firm that doesn't have any, any inventory related to it. They're probably not going to lose on that, in, that piece, that inherent risk related to the inventory, of course. Now, the second piece is going to be the controls. So the control risk is going to be completely in the hands of the company. What are the controls that they have? Now we're going to consider the processes that they have in place in order to safeguard things like assets and, and make sure the processes are correct. So if we're talking about cash, what type of controls do they have over cash? You know, do they have separate people handling? Do they put the cash in the bank, I hope? Do they have separate people handling it versus handling the cash and then uh, recording the cash, the separation of duties? So we can then set the controls high or low. And those two things, the inherent risk and the control risk, are the two things that belong to the company.
and not to us. We don't, we don't have the control over those as the auditor. Now, of course, again, the inherent risk is inherent to whatever type of business they're in. So the company really has control over the control risk, uh, and put it in a system of controls into their system. And then we're going to take a look at those two. And then we have the thing that's our responsibility. That's going to be the detection risk. And the detection risk is the risk that there's a material misstatement on the financial statements and we don't detect it. So that's going to be the detection risk. That's what we have control over. And that process could be due to not having appropriate procedures in there, not being able to apply the procedures appropriately, or coming just to the wrong conclusion based on the procedures that we have. So let's break this down one more time. We'll come back to it in a second. Audit risk equals inherent risk times control risk times detection risk. The two things that the company has control over, inherent risk and control risk, we have control over the detection risk. Now, there's another uh, risk that we want to be aware of, and that's going to be the engagement risk. So the engagement risk is the risk that we have a problem in terms of financial problem and or damage to our reputation through the engagement. So that's why it's really important, again, to get clients that we can trust doing business with the wrong people can harm the reputation, even if we do our due diligence on our side. Meaning, even if we did our due diligence and issued our report and did everything we're supposed to do, we could still get sued. Anybody can sue anybody. And if we get sued, even if we win the lawsuit, if we go through the lawsuit, we go through the process, we show all the paperwork and uh, our recording on it, and we win, it still could be a very damaging process to the reputation and cost a lot of time to go through that process. So the engagement risk is another risk that we want to uh, consider when going through the uh, process. So how can we use this formula in order for us to set the risk levels and ultimately to set up how much scope that we're going to have in the audit, how much testing we're going to have. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to set the plan level of audit risk. So the audit risk, we're going to set a level of audit risk, whether it be num numerically or in terms of words, high, low and medium type of audit risk. And then we're going to assess the risk of the inherent risk and the control risk, the things that are the responsibility of the company. And then we're going to use that in order to determine the detection risk. The detection risk being what's going to tell us how much we should work on this. What's the scope of the audit? How much substantive testing we're going to have? So the equation we started off with was, was um, audit risk equals inherent risk times control risk times detection risk. And we know that the thing that we have control over is the detection risk. So if we rewrite this equation, if we were to rewrite it, we would rewrite it as detection risk, the thing that we have control over, the thing that we want to determine, equals the audit risk, that's the level that we're going to set, divided by the things that are controlled by the company, which includes the inherent risk and the control risk. That's going to be the thought process through the equation that will help us determine the amount of testing that we're going to apply to any particular assertion based on an accounts or transactions uh, as we go through the process. If we were to think through this in terms of words, it might sound something like this. If we were not to put numbers in the equation, but some, put kind of the wording into the equation, we might look at a case where we had the one assertion, let's say the, the one assertion, we have the audit risk. If we say that we want to set the audit risk to be very low, being the terminology, and we're going to say that we assessed the control risk and the inherent risk, the risks that are able to be controlled by the company are high, then the detection risk, we're going to say, if we threw that equation, would be low. Or, for example, if we determine for a particular assertion that the audit risk needs to be low rather than very low, and we said that the things that are controlled by the company, the things uh, w would be inherent risk and the control risk are moderate, then the detection risk would be moderate. So note what we're basically doing here is we're saying the things that are controlled by the company, including the, the uh, internal controls, if they have good internal controls, then the risk related to the control risk is going to be lower, and therefore our detection risk could be higher, and we could spend less time, hopefully, in terms of the substantive testing in that scenario. So we're assessing what the company has control over. If they have good internal controls, and it's, it's an operation that has low inherent risk, then we can do less substantive testing by placing our detection risk at a higher level. We can sustain a higher level of detection risk and still have the same level of audit risk. When auditors conduct a risk assessment, they're going to have to have some kind of understanding of the business risks within the business. 
Now, the business risks aren't the same thing as the audit risks. They're going to be more broad in nature, but the business risk often has a significant or material f impact on the financial statements. Therefore, we're going to have to take a look at the business risks. So the business risks are going to be those things that are going to stop or be problems to potential risks for the business to obtain its objectives. So, for example, if the business has an objective to be a low-cost leader or to have a specialty product, and those are their goals and objectives within the business, we're looking for the risks that could be involved in that. For example, if we have a new product that is being made, uh, is that going to fall in within their overall strategy? We could have differences in the environment that's going to happen. Uh, if they're opening or closing a new department or things like this, these could be potential risks to the objectives of the business and things that we want to then take a look at. Now, oftentimes, management will actually usually have uh, an assessment of these types of risks and they will have an, a risk assessment plan that is something else that we also want to take a look at and see if that plan is effective in mitigating those types of business risks we're going to go over the auditor's risk assessment process and then we're going to drill down on these risk assessment components a bit more in detail so first of all this is the overview of the risk assessment process we're going to perform risk assessment procedures those risk assessment procedures are going to include inquiries of management and others we're going to do analytical procedures those are the things that can be done in the office generally they're going to be the ratio analysis we're going to have the observation and inspection and we'll talk more about that in a second and we are looking into these areas with these tools the inquiry the analytical procedures the observation we're looking into the nature of the entity the organization how it's structured these types of things industry regulations and um, external factors so what are the regulations within the industry the laws and regulations that could be affecting the business within the uh, environment that they are in objectives of the business so what are their goals what are their objectives and what is their assessment of their own risks into the future and what are their goal their plans to mitigate those risks we're going to look into the entity entity performance so their own performance have they been setting the goals have been they been meeting their own goals and what's the feedback on that in their own uh, words in terms of meeting or not meeting those goals internal controls we'll talk a lot more about internal controls as we go but uh, the main thing i want you to think about internal control is going to be the separation of duties but in, in general, they're going to be those types of processes that are in place to make sure that and help to achieve the goals and objectives of the organization. Then we're going to identify the risk that may result in a material statement to the financial statement. We're going to take a look at the management's plan to uh, mitigate those risks. And then we'll use that to assess the risk of a material misstatement on the financial statement. So remember the tools that we will be using will include inquiry. We're going to use analytical procedures. We're going to use observation and inspection. So inquiry are going to be those things like we're going to talk to management, of course. We're going to talk to management about all these types of things that we just went over, the organizational structure, what are their goals and objectives, how are they mitigating these goals. We're going to, have, we're going to inquire a lot to management, of course. But we're also going to talk to other employees. We'll talk to other uh, lower level management we'll talk to other employees possibly we may possibly be talking to customers and we could get some information from them vendors outside third parties possibly in terms of banks or people that are doing business with the organization that could help us with the planning now note that don't get this confused with the later process when we do the substantive testing of course then we're going to do some more types of inquiry and some type of get some third party verification from things like banks and whatnot uh, remember here we're, we're doing the risk assessment and even in this process in the preliminary process before we're doing substantive testing we, we're going to question some of these types of things to assess the risk and then we can have the analytical procedures those are going to be the things that again we can kind of do in the office we can do ratio analysis we can see how this year compared to last year that can give us a lot of information that we can then kind of drill down to on in terms of our risk assessment and look into these types these things more in depth and that's another one that we're going to do more in the substantive test. We're going to do it later in the audit as well, but we're also going to do it here in the risk assessment stage. And we have observation and inspection. So we can take a look at any activities. We can actually observe the activities. We can inspect documents. We can go in there and, and take a look at the documentation. We can look at reports. We can, tr we can do tracing of transactions, like tracing the invoice through the process to the financial statement. These, again, are going to be activities that we will do in the substantive testing, but we also want to do some of it here when we're thinking about the risk assessment process.
we are using those tools to understand the entity and its environment. So we're using the tools of the inquiry, the analytical procedures, the observation in order to understand the entity and its environment, including the nature of the entity. We'll break down into more of these in depth in a second. The nature of the entity, um, regulations, the internal controls, the objectives and strategies of the business, and the entity performance measures. So when we think about the nature of the entity, what is the nature of the entity? We've got the entity's organizational structure, who is management, how, what's the organizational chart look like, who reports to who, the source of the funding of the organization, what's the major source of funding. So what kind of things could result from in a misstatement? We could have an inaccuracy in the gathering or the processing of the data to the financial statements. We could have an omission if something didn't make it to the financial statements. That's, of course, going to be a problem. And then there's, there's going to be the issue of the estimates. What kind of estimates are being used? Are the estimates being, being appropriate? And do we, as the auditors, agree with the estimates that are being made? So if we're talking about estimates like the allowance for undoubtful accounts, how much of your accounts receivable do you think are going to be uncollectible? That's something that could vary. So we, we need to determine whether the estimates that are being made, are they being made, first of all? Do we have an allowance for uncollectible accounts? Should we have an allowance? And if there is one, is it a, is it a reasonable type of calculation? Same thing for like depreciation and other, other estimates, warranties, and other estimates that will be involved in the financial statement. When we assess the risk of the material misstatements, there are two things that could result in the misstatements. We could have a risk misstatement resulting in an unintentional error, or we could have a misstatement that is a result of an intentional error, and that would be fraud. So those are the two categories we're looking into. I, and we need to test for both of them because either one of those could result in a material misstatement. That's what we're looking for. We're trying to make sure that the financial statements are reported materially correctly. So we need to find material errors that are in there, potentially in there. And we need to test for material fraud that could potentially be in there as well. So this idea of intention is an interesting one when we think about fraud. A fraud is going to be something that has, a, has an intent to deceive, usually for personal gain. So it's going to have two categories that usually are involved in fraud. We could have the fraud of the financial reporting, or we can have a fraud in terms of misappropriation of assets. So a fraud in the financial reporting means that there's been some intentional deceit in the way the financial statements were reported. So there's some fraudulation within the documentation, within the reporting process, therefore the financial statements are reported incorrectly. Now, nothing has been stolen in that case, it's a reporting error. And then we have the misappropriation of assets. That's, of course, when something is actually stolen. And either of these two can be large enough to create a material misstatement in the financials. But the fraud related to the financial reporting is probably done by a higher level of management, which in some ways is going to be more concerning because if a higher level of management is dishonest in that way, then it's more likely or more risky that we have a material misstatement in the financial reporting. In order to assess the risk of fraud within the audits, we're going to have communication with the audit team to look out for fraud and also to correlate our findings with each other to see if anything is not in congruence, to see if there's any indications of fraud in that case. We're going to have inquiries of management and others. So we're going to actually directly ask management and others related to fraud and other types of things. We're going to have analytical procedures and see if the analytical procedures are pointing to anything that could be an indication of fraud. Those are the things that are going to be done in the office, to have those kind of ratio analysis. And, and we have investigation of unexpected period end adjustments. Remember, those period end adjustments are going to be those things that are done at the end of the year or the end of the period, and they have to do with timing. So those are often the things that will be there, especially when we're thinking about frauds in terms of financial reporting fraud, because if someone was trying to fix the numbers as of the cutoff date, one of the easiest ways to do that is to try to uh, change the timing of, an, of a transaction and bring revenue, for, for example, into this period or expenses, push them out into the other period if you're trying to look better. Now, when we, when we look at fraud, we often think that how do you prevent fraud? Well, it just depends on the people you have. If you have good people, then you're just not going to have fraud. And if you, have, if you don't have good people, then you're going to have fraud. And that's not exactly always the case. We know that there are going to be circumstances in which fraud is more likely to happen. And uh, the most common case of that is if you, know, if you have a starving family that needs food and you steal bread, then these conditions, are going, these conditions are generally going to be met. And that's going to be an incentive or pressure. So you got pressure to do that because of the starving family. You have the opportunity 
to carry out the fraud, assuming that the theft of the bread is, is something that you can do. And you have the attitude or rationaliz rationalization in which to do, do the act, to steal the bread. And that rationalization is going to be, well, we really, 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 really need it. <laughs> so, so that's going to be a, a common type of thing within the fraud. We, we think of those same things within the audit environment of a company. If the company has an environment that has those three things in it, we have some control over some of those things. So if there's, if there's incentive or pressure and there's an opportunity and there's rationalization, a basic example of this would be if the company puts money in their petty cash fund in a shoebox in the middle of the dining room where thousands of people go into every hour, then that's probably not a secure place for it. And if someone that has financial pressure goes in there and they realize that they can take the money and not have any consequences for it, and that and they can rationalize that, and the rationalization often goes something like, well, if the company's so dumb to put the money in the middle of the table, then uh, they deserve to lose it. Or, or the common rationalization for large companies are often going to be, this is a large company, I'm a small individual, I need the money more than the company needs the money, it's very small in relation. Now notice that this example would likely not cause a material misstatement on the financial statement. It's likely not something that we would even be looking, it would be under our, mater our materiality threshold. But note that if the internal controls aren't in place to catch things like that, then there's also this idea that fraud tends to keep going and escalate. And so if, if we just kept putting petty cash into that shoebox and we didn't even realize that it was being thefted, we just kept petty cash at $500, whatever was gone, we put more in there, then it's likely that that's, that type of scenario is going to keep on happening and it may then go to somewhere else. So we do need the, the internal controls in terms of catching the fraud as, as well as preventing the fraud and that will help to prevent it from escalating as well. Risk factors related to incentive for larger scale fraud often has to do with incentive from outside third parties. And we're talking about financial fraud usually in this case. So there's usually a lot of pressure to have continuing up, upward numbers on the financial statements through the investors who are looking for increased value and upper management who are looking to achieve certain goals. There could be large bonuses that are gonna be riding on the achievement of certain goals and that's going to lead that could lead to the falsification or a more likely condition to have fraud happen so notice that these types of bonuses and these types of incentives and this type of pressure is usually a good thing because it drives performance upward but unfortunately it can backfire in that it can be something that could create an environment in which it's more likely to have that pressure which could cause fraud to happen the risk factor related to the opportunity of the fraud one, the opportunity of fraud could just be greater in the type of organization we're in. So some organizations are going to be more inherently risky than others. So if we work at a casino which has thousands of dollars on the floor, well, the fact that there's thousands of dollars on the floor of the casino makes it more inherently risky. We can try to mitigate that by having more controls over that, but that inherent risk is going to be there. We want to make sure that there's going to be the controls in place. And controls usually include things like separation of duties. One individual should not be able to basically uh, steal money and not have it be reported or caught at some other time. We should have separation of duty so that uh, someone else is reporting and someone else is handling assets and things like that. And uh, we also want to have the supervision involved. So we should have uh, certain aspects, especially more highly risky aspects, being more supervised. So all the cash on the floor of the casino is clearly going to be highly supervised and regulated. Over complex organizational structure can also be a problem as well because if there's not a clear lineage of who does what and who reports to who and who's in charge of certain things, if there's overlap between duties, then things fall through the, through the cracks and oftentimes we don't know who's accountable and that can lead to an increase in the likelihood of fraud as well in terms of opportunity. The auditor has the responsibility to document all of this information as they go as well. We want to be able to provide this to a third party to be able to look through it and say that these procedures have been done. We want to have discussions amongst the engagement personnel. We want to have procedures performed to identify and assess the risk of the material misstatement. And we want to look at fraud risks and document the activities that we have done in order to assess the risk of fraud. If fraud is detected, the, the auditor does have a responsibility to report that to the appropriate level of management. 
that would be if it's to the lower individuals within the organization, we can go to upper management and report the fraud. So much of the fraud is going to be often be done by uh, employees. In that case, we can report it. That's that can usually be handled because then management can generally fire the employees. If the fraud is in upper management, that's going to be more of a problem. Of course, that's more of a concern for us because that's clearly going to be a higher risk in terms of having the financial statements reported incorrectly and we're going to want to report that directly to the audit committee of the board of directors.